Right, check. All right, we are getting ready to kick off our next panel. I am so excited to welcome Jennifer Reiser, who authored the book on Burning Man, Art on Fire, and Community Artist, along with Natalia Bertotti and Michael Garlington on stage. Please welcome them on the stage. Thank you. Hello. Right, here we go. Okay. So we're burners, so we're going to be very informal. Um, so what we'd love to do is chat for a little while. We have some images of uh, Natalia and Michael's work. And then um, we'll chat for about 30 minutes and then open it up for your questions, if you'd like. And um, we, we go way back, so we're not going to be very stuffy about all this, um, which we hope is okay. Um, the, thing, the thing especially about you need to know about Michael is that even if you gave him a prepared agenda... You couldn't follow it. So we, we haven't even done that. <laughs> so true. Um, so the, the panel is, is really about how you build community with art and technology. And um, Michael and Natalia have been working in a huge range of media for the past 10 years or so. Um, Michael started with photography. And he actually worked uh, developing in uh, the darkroom at his parents' shop after school and then um, started doing photography on his own, went out to Burning Man and was building and picked up a camera and sort of never looked back. Yeah. Um, and, then, uh, and then Natalia had started working with him and the two of them have formed an incredible creative partnership as well as um, a real friendship. And they scheme up these amazing ideas. One of the things that's so interesting about uh, the two of them as a pair is that um, they do everything. So you will see Natalia as a character in many of these photographs that Michael takes, but Natalia and Michael have also built the costume or created the mask or made something out of cardboard that is the set for the photograph that Natalia is in, or Natalia will transmogrify herself into another creature and then Michael take the picture, and then they'll develop the picture, then they'll digitize the picture, then they will print it and then mount it onto plywood, then they will build a sculpture out of it, then that will become a diorama, then those dioramas will fit into an even larger sculptural piece. And they, they are a very interesting pair in that they create their own sense of community um, in how they work interchangeably, and yet each of them has their own vision and, and in each situation a different role. Um, so it's fascinating. I think what we'd like to do is show you a little bit of their work, and that will give you a sense of what they do and how they do it, and then we will talk a little bit about their process and also how, um, how people come and gather to that <coughs> and how that sense of community informs um, new conversations about art. Um, it's, it's unusual in this day and age to have people who are still makers, who are still doing things with their hands, who actually control absolutely every aspect of the process from develop, taking the image, building the costumes, doing the makeup, developing the image, printing, and making it into something else, and then giving it away to the community so that people have their own interactive response to it. The, the viewer becomes part of the art installation. So let's have a look. Well, you've said it all, so good night, ladies. <laughs> no, that was, this, the picture you're seeing here is uh, it's from the, the a Smithsonian show. So we have a show right now, uh, The Art of Bur uh, Burning Man, No Spectators. And uh, this is looking through one of the arch, arch doorways into the gallery room of the arch we built. And it's all built of wood and photographic materials, uh, pockets of wonder. Also, when you go up to this arch, maybe we can go to the next one that kind of shows the arch in its full form. Hopefully, it's the next one. And yes, I think that's it. That's it. So this, as you enter into the Renwick, um, this is like a portal into the show. Um, and as you walk through, it is full of detail 
and, and photographs that, that are framed by elements of photographs. So Natalia will go and she'll take photographs of the succulents and the shells and the different elements and we will frame out the scenar scenes and scenarios that we make. Also within this arch, there are little holes you can look through into worlds of paper and wonder. Um, and it's a mirror trick, so when you look into the hole, you see your own eye floating in there. So it really is an interactive piece between you and the piece, uh, where you, your eye becomes part of the artwork. So, And also the arch being something that you can walk around, and there's just different um, photographs through it. Like, you can see all the cells. And so people can kind of make up their own stories for what these photographs that we make are. So the, I'm going to chat about the arch for a moment. If you get a chance to make it to the Renwick show, it's really, it's really quite something. Um, it takes over the whole Renwick Gallery, which is uh, an old Victorian building devoted to arts and crafts. It is literally across from the White House. And um, all of the art is interactive in some way and is um, really reflective of Burning Man culture. And if you had told me even five years ago that Burning Man art would be in the Smithsonian, we all would have laughed at you because um, Burning Man art has really gone from um, being this little thing where the art really, the art was about the process and not about the finished product to an experience in the desert and now to an experience in the world. And um, Michael and Natalia have, have been a big part of making that, um, that thing turn into a movement which is now um, being given to the world. And what I love about Burning Man is that uh, here's a place that artists like us can go, and, and in, the, in the olden times, uh, we would probably be building churches, you know, to God or something like this. But we can go and build these, these temples or these chapels, but they're built for art. They're built to art. So everybody is, can be involved, and everybody can be part of the, the, the piece. So, I mean, here's places you can build temples as intricate as you want out in the middle of a place where you can't even imagine how hot and windy it is. Uh, but then you could also see a cupcake car go by or a big duck. I mean, uh, it, the art there is so subjective, and that's what's so wonderful about it because it doesn't say, like, oh, this is the greatest art. It, it leaves it up to the viewer to decide what, what touches them, you know, and so this gave us this incredible palette and this, this beautiful canvas to go and just build to our heart's content uh, and hope to reach out to these to anybody that might want to come in and see the wonder, you know? Um, so it's just been incredibly exciting. And yes, we never thought we'd be at the Smithsonian. No, I mean, I thought, you know, okay, I'll do Burning Man for a few years and then I'm gonna go a uh, bum change in Seattle. But I mean, this was a place that you could really go and, and learn all these techniques, these tools, and not really be scrutinized uh, so that you lose your confidence. I mean, it actually builds your confidence. It makes you want to, you know, strive harder and you meet all these progressive minds and it's not about a sex party in the desert. It's, it's really, I mean, sometimes, but I, I didn't see it. I didn't see that as much. I mean, but it was a place where really these minds came together and we suffered these wind and these sandstorms and this uh, and the heat. Uh, but at the end of the day, we all sat near the most glorious uh, sunset uh, together and we made it through another day. As long as you drink water, I mean, the desert wants to eat you, but if you drink water, you will sit at that sunset together. That's wonderful. So this piece Bob, is, Bob. is an invitation at the Renwick. It's the first piece you see when you come in the door and go to the left, and in a way, it's an invitation to the experience of Burning Man to participate um, and to uh, let go of your expectations. You can see there's real components of fantasy. Um, each of these characters in these images is Natalia, um, dressed and decorated and adorned. And then um, there's all kinds of symbols and symbolism. And you could imagine that, that that's a dust storm coming off. You could imagine that that's flames because... Because normally, of the White House. It's, it could, right, <laughs> exactly. Um, and, and it's just a great way to say, welcome to Oz, suspend your disbelief and play. And one of the people in uh, the, one of the pictures, uh, we can't zoom in on it, but uh, it's actress Susan Sarandon, who um, came to one of our, we were fundraising 
for the next piece. Actually, you can put the next piece up. Are you done with the Renwick? Yeah, yeah okay. that's great. Which is also on the cover of Jennifer's beautiful book. Yes. The Art of Burning Man. <laughs> Which is, the book is so beautifully amazing. So this piece here is uh, the Totem of Confessions. It's a 60-foot chapel of paper. You can uh, walk inside of it, and stained glass will... Uh, uh, it, it was just so beautiful. Yeah, you go. <laughs> so it was a confession booth, and you could be the confessor or the confessee when you walked inside. And there was also an altar that contained the ashes of Timothy Leary. Which, um, is, why, which is why Susan came. So Susan came. We were fundraising for this, and... Uh, she had seen our piece the year before and, you know, needed to find us. So she came and found us, and I, I was starstruck. I don't follow stars. I mean, I follow them, but I don't uh, stalk them. And uh, so there she was, and uh, she said, I've been carrying around Timothy Leary's ashes in this necklace for far too long. When he died, he knew he was dying. Uh, he had cancer, so he wanted to give her ashes. He gave some other friend's ashes, he shot some into space. But uh, anyway, she'd been carrying this around, so she wanted a place to finally put it to rest. So she asked, would you build a place in your next piece to put Timothy Leary? And I said, that sounds great. Do you want to come be on our crew? And she said, yes. And I said, oh, what have I got myself into? You know, you, know, you invite a celebrity out to this very brutal climate. But she came, and we didn't pull out a red carpet, and this, the dust storms came, and she was so intense, and she didn't complain at all. And after a while, she just became, she was one of the crew to begin with. And so it was an incredible experience. Where celebrities, to Joe Schmo, all come together and work to build something like this. Well, as we, as we think about art and community, one of, the, one of the most important values of Burning Man is radical inclusion. And so this art is the ultimate includer both in terms of putting it up because Burning Man does not fund the art they will give the artist an honoraria but the artist has to raise the rest of the money to pay for a piece and you can imagine what a piece like this costs and so therefore what happens is people have to rally around the piece and provide physical support they provide help with the labor or they provide you know they provide funding for transportation or they find ways to get around the piece and that actually builds a sense of community and ownership because while this was the vision and the concept of Natalia and Michael it belonged to the community and people felt a real sense of of ownership and then when you open it to the community at Burning Man when the participants arrive and they're interacting with the pieces and they're responding to the pieces and they're looking through these little peepholes and they're surprised in the confession booth because they're in one side telling their deepest secrets and someone they've never met is on the other side of the booth listening and being sympathetic. That creates instant community um, in a way that very few things can do. And I think the idea of art lets people let go of their identities and just lose themselves in the fantasy. This was very much uh, a fantastical piece and, um, and, and very much a favorite in 2015 when it was built. Oh, my God. Yeah, you should see we have some pictures of it burning. Um, if you might change the to the burn. Because that's definitely that. another gathering point for... People is on the burn nights. Everybody bundles up, gets warm, and the excitement builds for the burns. And I mean, we even had a crew that was specifically dedicated just to burning that was totally different from our build crew. So I, I am very impressed with Burning Man and the levels of community from the people that build the city to the artists that come and bring art for the city and then the people that come to bring the experiences in the city, whether it be the sound camps or food, and, I mean, the people that love to burn things, because they helped us put this out, because we weren't going to put it out. <laughs> but they made it an, an incredible explosion for us. <laughs> so I'm going to ask a question that's asked of me a lot, of the two of you, which is, why would you spend six months building something and then burn it? Well... We just, I mean, we, bur we build knowing that it's going to burn in the end. And so it's kind of just, we love to build and create this place for people to enjoy. And 
I mean, we're not afraid to let go of it, and we kind of can take from it all the experiences that we get from building it, the troubleshooting and all these different things, so we know that we can build more in the future. So it's kind of like laying a brick in a building. And so, and obviously building this has led us to the Renwick and to who knows what in the future. So we're happy to build a piece like this and nowhere else could we build something of this scale. So Burning Man definitely offers that because this is just for a week so we can build out of wooden paper, but hopefully this enables us to build in the future in a more permanent way which I know you'd love to discuss. Yeah, well, I, I mean, letting it go is, uh, is easy when you know you're going to burn it, like Natalia said. I mean, it's like a big sand mandala. You know, you spend maybe a year putting this sand together, and then, you know, you let it go. Um, and, but in these days with book covers and your iPhone, you know, the totem always stays in one's pocket or one's consciousness. Uh, so letting it go, the physical pieces of paper and wood, was really easy. And... Um, uh, I don't know about environmentally easy. That's something that weighs on my mind, I have to be honest. But uh, as far as the ritual, there's nothing more powerful that I've seen than burning a church. Um, you know, so there you go. I, I couldn't quite let it go. <laughs> I know you put it on your book. I, I, well, I not only couldn't let it go because I saw this piece and got completely obsessed with it and had to visit it every single day in all different hours of the day to see it because it kept changing in the light. And I would drag everyone who I, everyone said, so what's good art there this year? And I'd be like, come here, come with me and drag them out. But then um, the hour before it was shut down to burn, Michael and Natalia kindly said, anything you can pull off is yours. Yeah. And so I did. Yeah, we, we pulled <laughs> off a lot of the pieces. I mean, as many of the pieces that we can could and gave it to the, to the crowd. Uh, so they could put it on their wall, people, something they could remember. Because, I mean, I, we don't want to burn anything that we don't have to burn, right? So, so uh, a, a very minor version of this is, is now in my home. Michael and Natalia <laughs> came and the reinstalled <laughs> the <laughs> few the little bathroom. pieces that I was able to salvage, which was really fun. Um, and, and the thing about creating community is when you share the experience of seeing a piece of art go away, that also has a real bonding effect. Um, I will remember where I was that night. What, who I was with, how I was standing. Um, it's, it's very powerful to be in the presence of an intentional burn, um, especially when it's something so beautiful that's hard to let go. It's a, it's a great metaphor. Mm, yeah. Well, how would we take this to the future? I mean, how do we... Next what? picture? Oh, no, I was saying, oh. like, bringing these paper and these, uh, these, these pieces that are built to burn, how can we make them permanent pieces? So we started thinking this. How do we do this? Um, Which is interesting because most of the pieces oh, you do are not permanent. Right. So how do you, what's compelling you to think about making them more permanent? Just you saying that. You saying, I wish I could see it longer. I wish I could be with it, you know. And, and me saying, do I want to burn everything? I mean, it, there is a ritual to it. And, I, you know, like we wouldn't be at the Smithsonian without Burning Man. Thank you, Burning Man. Uh, they've given us this sort of beautiful place to go build these beautiful things. But I would like to see... My technology, the future of my technology, our technology would be to make these structures, but instead of paper and wood, maybe out of ceramic. So you would glaze the photos. They're all made of photos, but glaze them on tiles. And so it would be something that could last for, I mean, forever is sort of a strange concept, but for a very long time. So you could come, and everybody could come and see it, and be in it, and be with it. Uh, yeah, that would be, that'd be my dream. It's one of the things I love about these two is that they always have a next. Okay, that one's done. They're already, last night they're busy building their next project. I get, you know, I'm looking at pictures of them from 1130 at night doing this giant <laughs> install because it's, they're on to the next. There's never, they, they don't sit around and say, yeah, we have a piece in the Smithsonian. Someone will come along and invite us to do something else. Heard of that place. What is that place? <laughs> okay, next picture. Mm -hmm. What do we got? Let's go to it on bla it's in, on, engulfed in flames, I think. The next one down. Yeah. Whoa. Come on. This thing burned it down in about 12 minutes uh, because of the nature of its uh, structure. It was a, like a big chimney. Um, and then the, the stained glass steeple just exploded off the top. I mean, you saw this thing, right? Wow. It was 
It was not anticlimactic, that's for sure. And then through the night, people stood around the fire, ah. and maybe they could reminisce about their experiences in it, too. I mean, at that point, we were so tired, and we knew that we had to clean up the mess the next day, so we didn't stay with it through the whole night. But I imagine that there's definitely community around the fire, too. And we had someone that was part of our crew that kept kind of putting the ashes onto themselves to burn as much of it up as we could. And, yeah, and the next day, we're just sitting there in the ashes of what was. Yeah. <laughs> It's kind of a humbling experience, it's actually. Humbling. Yeah, because it's gone, and your glory is gone, and it's kind of good. Your head is deflated. It's beautiful. Because you are the, now you have to shovel it up. I mean, some people get crews, but we don't. I mean, we have crews to help us, but we're, we're there. Oh, my gosh. Our moms were out there helping Our us. Our moms were out there. <laughs> they were the Mom, first ones. Yeah. clean up your mess, See, as it usual. It keeps family it's together, too. <laughs> families were out at Burning Man. I mean, yeah. I say, yeah, the community layers are... Just unbelievable. I mean, that is another beautiful thing about Burning Man uh, is the leave no trace aspect. I mean, this, they're so serious about it. When the BLM comes around to, you know, do their survey, they bring a, a Ziploc bag and, if, and a little sandwich bag. And if they're able to uh, find any moop uh, that fills that bag, they don't, pass the, they don't pass the thing. So you can see how serious they are about uh, projects cleaning up every ounce of their mess or, or scar on the playa so I don't know I think it's just kind of the most incredible thing I've ever seen you know so every nail that went into this piece had to be picked up every that wasn't gonna burn yeah. every glow stick that someone left there thank goodness for magnet rakes yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. so a lot of screws <laughs> Yeah, what th next? There's, oh, yeah. So next, what do we have? Well, we have a picture of... I think there's photos of Photo Chapel. Photo Chapel. So 2013. So we're going back in time. This was we Michael and Natalia's first, first large-scale piece um, called Photo Chapel. This is where Natalia and I really kind of met. So yeah. she walked in off the street and we... <laughs> I found you at Burning Man, actually. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> and then I walked off the street yeah. and walked into the studio. And this was, yeah, this was definitely the first big collaboration that we ever did with each other. But this was your first. This was the second project I did at Burning Man. But of your own. Of my own, I should yeah. say. Yeah. The first one was a large-scale uh, word that said egos for Laura Kimpton, who's built many word sculptures. Um, so, yeah, so the next year, it, it got us this piece here, the photo chapel. Uh, and again, it was just this, this is the place that uh, Susan Sarandon walked in and said, this is where I want to put Timothy if they ever do a project again. Um, and it was, it was going out of the concept of that I, I'm a photographer and I'm used to selling prints, one of 30, one of 40, but I always wanted to make these prints one of one. And, uh, and I always loved to see pieces on the wall like as a salon, so I said, I would like to build a structure that is all encompassed by photographs, you know, so people could just sort of walk around and be a gallery, but it'd be a structure, but it'd be a sculpture, and it'd be a place you go inside, and it would be a place with a confessional with a glory hole, and it would be a catacombs, so it had all these elements that I sort of had uh, been inspired with by going to Europe and going down into the catacombs and seeing all these churches, um, uh, yeah. So there it is. Let's talk about your portraiture for yep. a little bit, because that's where it all started. So let's talk about the technical aspects of what you do, your camera, your developing, how you imagine a portrait. Well, it's all, um, it's all four by five film. So I grew up in a family that uh, we processed black and white uh, pictures for, for San Francisco and the big shooters in San Francisco. Uh, and this was before right before digital took over completely. So we were still printing prints and, and doing ads. <clears throat> and I, I never really um, took a portrait for 10 years. I printed and printed and learned the technique of printing. And then uh, finally, I, I just got so fed up with being alone in a dark room that I went out and found people and started building these concepts. So every weekend I would go out and find people and photograph them, and it would be like a drug. I would be, I would go back to the dark room and print up the, the naked people standing in the woods, and I would be like, oh my God, this is better than any drug I've ever had. 
And I started to collect and collect and collect photos, not to go to a gallery. Just one day, my dream was maybe someday someone would go up into an attic and open up a box and say, what the fuck was this person thinking? I just wanted this sort of mystery and this dark wonder. And what is this all about? What was going through the mind? Um, and so it just became, and it still is the same way, whether it be building these things, it's just like, how far can we push ourselves? What can we do next to make the wonder? Can you tell us about your camera? Oh, it's a, it's a four by five camera. It's a, a little uh, Graflex. It's, it's kind of the camera that maybe Ouija would have used, you know, the old press camera. Uh, Hey, let me get your pictures, eh? <laughs> That's the one. Uh, but, it's, uh, but I put it on a tripod, and I open it up, and when people see it, it's almost like a relationship they start to form, not with just crazy me, but with that camera itself. People, because with digital, you shoot 100 pictures. Or, you know, With this camera, we shoot maybe four shots, four shots. And so we just take our time, and people really sit down, and they hold still, because it's really like that old time, like, don't move or you'll be out of focus thing, you know. Yeah. And so when we shot, we did Jennifer's portrait, and she, we have the dogs there, and she's in this incredible dress. And you got to kind of be funny and got to be kind of a d dork or, or you be a free. And so Jennifer's got to hold it out like this, you know. But hold still, right? So you have to believe it or trust me and, you know. So it is kind of that, that relationship that people form with that camera, you know. I think more than anything technical. I mean, I, I know a few things, but... It really is the magic of that, that four by five. So why are you so interested in portraiture? Because all of your pieces, the building blocks of all of these pieces start with the image of a human. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is. I mean, it's just like how these places you could go inside and you can be part of. It's really just about that communication. It's that um, here we are on this planet for as long as we are. But if we can somehow, for me at least, communicate with other people, share what's inside them, me with other people, whether they like it or not, or it's scary or it's weird. Uh, if I could just share that uh, through these or through a photo or, or the time I spend with people, um, I feel fulfilled, you know? I mean, I think with some of your portraits too, it's like you can see someone's whole life just in that portrait, just by whether it be the expression in their face. I mean, sometimes we create kind of fantastical worlds, but I mean, even outside of that with the family portraits and things like that. It's just like you see so many levels and layers into people. And then those are encased by these fantastical worlds of shells and animals and flowers. And yeah. we are all just part of nature. And that's what we're creating too. What's yeah. innate in us. So true. And can we talk about your materials? Because you guys are scrappy, quite literally. I mean, anything... We find. I mean, the, the, what's been so great? Let's talk. You talk about the paper, hold, though. Hold this up. Oh yeah, sorry. T talk about the paper. Well, just how photograph. Well, how being able to print these images on like newsprint and then put it on a piece of wood has like such depth. Right. The photographs that we use, it, it, it does take on a more of a three-dimensional quality because we tend to recess the portrait into the back and then have different levels kind of popping out of it, but since everything is a photograph, it already has an amount of depth to it. So then things just start, I mean, as I start looking at the pieces, sometimes it's just like my eyes don't know where to stop because it just, you, it kind of just takes you on a road. And that's what we like when people come to see the artwork too, is that they can always come back and see something different, which is probably what drew you there as well. It's like every time you might find something that you didn't see the first time around, or if you went backwards through it, forwards, you would see things differently. Because that is definitely a, a quality of us, is lots of layers and details. Do you think about those from the start, or do you just do you keep coming up with them as you're building a piece like this? I mean, there's always a framework for me. You know, there's a, there's a structure. You know, we have to have a structure first to build upon so that we yep. can do jazz. You totally. know, jazz needs some sort of structure. And a lot of our schematics tend to be more of a shape of what it's going to be. But then we leave ourselves with some of the fluidity of what to fill it with. But a lot of that does come as we're creating, which makes the process of creating so much fun for us, too, because we're Joy. surprised <laughs> as joyful. we're doing it. Yeah. 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 And we always try to work that way, too. Just like if we're not having fun, we just step away for a little bit yeah. because we feel that comes across in the artwork as well. I mean, there are hard days. I mean, making art, just like anything, is just like exercise. You know, you, you get up in the morning and you want 
to get your ass looking good, you've got to go to the gym. So, I mean, it's the same thing with art. we got to get up, and sometimes it's harder. Um, and sometimes you, you leave at the end of the day and say, ah, oh, it's shit. But then you come back and you realize that was just the first la la layer, you know? So when you go the next day, put another layer on it, the next day another layer, and that first failure, you said, is actually the biggest success you've ever seen. So it's really just the exercise of, of just the repetition and the discipline of just doing it and not, not giving up. I mean, and everybody, so the people will say, give up, you'll never make it. <laughs> And I say, thank goodness we have each other. <laughs> you gotta have oh, you. You're doing so well. Oh, that looks so great. Like we totally encourage you're each other to yeah. keep She's going. She's the most amazing person I've oh, ever he met. He is. Yes, yeah, stop it. <laughs> awesome. So, so when you get donated materials, how do you think about that? Because you're you're using things from yeah. your uncle's upholstery yeah, shop exactly. and from the dump and from. I mean, it's been an evolution of that because you know you move into a big studio like this and you take everything. And then you realize some of this stuff just sits stagnant against the wall. And you realize, oh, shit, I'm going to end up a hoarder. I know it. You know, I've seen these hoarders, and they just have it. One day it's going to become this thing. Yeah, one day it'll be this thing. So <laughs> I, someone very smart once said, you know, there's so much stuff out there in the world. There's so much. Um, so, and, and they'll hold it for you, like the dump or anything. So you can always get it, but you don't have to be the one holding it. So I think now we kind of keep our studio... If we're going to be using fabric, so we'll be finding fabric. If we're going to be using, uh, say, china or glass, we'll find that and, and turn it into a piece. But we got about a three-month rule or something. If it sits around or stagnant, we got to get it out because we have to keep that thing rolling, keep it rolling. And you learn that just over time and having this, the space. Definitely. And then even just the burning of artwork, it's kind of like we are good at the let-go process. So yeah. it's almost as if, yeah, that stagnant energy of stuff sitting around just isn't. It's not fun it doesn't to help out. us, yeah. yeah, to create more, in a sense. Yeah. It almost helps us if it's empty, and then we're like, we got to make something to fill yeah, the space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, we come back, and one of these things burn. We want to go, and I'm um, sorry about the microphone, but we, we want to go, and, and it's so exciting, too, and frightful. Like, what yes. will we do? Oh, yeah. And that's gonna... why we're always on to the next thing, because we're just, like, in an empty space. We're like, what do ah. we do now? Yeah. But, but it's, we know how it's to incredible do it. when people bring us things, because that is an inspiration for us to be like, what can we make out of this? Yes, yes. And we do. Now we need to find a thousand pieces of little tiki wood. <laughs> make a costume. Yeah. Easy. Paper. I love paper. What's our name? Do we have any more photos? I think that's it. That's it. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, I think any it's a questions? perfect time because we have 10 minutes. Love to ask questions if anyone has any. Or if not, that's fine. Yeah. Keep talking. Please Hi, keep thank you. Um, this is very beautiful. I've been to Burning Man many times, and I can totally see this being the perfect experience um, of connection with, with something beyond. But I guess that my question is, what's your vision to bring these pieces into the default world, like in the, in the real world that we all live in, like in San Francisco, like in the streets of San Francisco? How do you... What's your vision of building community out of... Um, not only one week a year, but what's your big picture about influencing and raising questions right now? Thank you. You want to take that? Okay. Well, you know, wait, so... Up, up. Up, up, up. Yeah, so bringing, I would just like to, honestly, I would just like to bring the feeling that Jennifer and the people that I've met out at Burning Man have said, don't burn this thing, don't burn this thing, don't burn this thing. And I, I know it has to burn. Uh, but all of a sudden I meet, meet somebody and we're, we're having these incredible conversations. That, or I just go into the place and I see people looking through the holes of the, into these worlds of wonder and they're just so happy, the joy that I see in them. Maybe they, their day has been shitty, I, I don't know. But they, they come in to a place of art. I would like to build places of wonder that take away the pain and, and take away Fox News and take away CNN and take away all this bullshit and just give a moment of joy to someone's life if I can do that. And boy, that might be a tall order, but uh, that's going to be my life goal. So if I can bring that somehow permanently into the city or somewhere where kids or people that have just had... I mean, I, I am up to my, my ears in this, this time, in this day and age, too. So, I mean, I need a place to escape uh, to a positive realm you know i need that so if i can help do that i'd love to so i'd hope it'd be san francisco or, or but you're anywhere. gonna have to change your technique because 
everything you build or yeah, most well, yeah, everything you built thus far has been pretty well, ephemeral. I mean, uh, we've gotten into ceramics. I mean, so ceramics have such possibility, and we know to be a fact. You know, you go see, to see Gaudi piece, and um, they've been around, so they, they're going to last. And if you go to Rome, I mean, you see enough ceramics that have been around forever. So I think that with steel and ceramics, we can achieve the same feeling uh, of those pieces that you've seen at Burning Man or at the Smithsonian, but that could live outside and have, have that sort of um, lasting quality. So that to us is the technology which would seem an old technology, but to us would be a new one. Yeah, I think we're definitely willing to embrace new um, art styles just to get some artwork out that people can enjoy all the time. And it's great to see that a lot of the building projects now require an art piece. And some of those can be indoors too. I mean, there's huge spaces like this that some of our wood paper artworks could be created. And to create the community around that, it's kind of like we love to bring people in to help us work on the projects and even helping us to like do the paperwork for grants because sometimes we're just so busy doing stuff that it's just hard for us to find those different projects to even try for because there are so many opportunities now I feel like, and people tell us all the time, like, you guys need to be applying for things, and it's just like, ah, I don't know, this is like, there's so much for us to do. Yeah, we're just, it's really just like the two of us. Yes. Uh. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we welcome people to come and help us to keep building more and more, and if anyone out there has anything for us to build or want to come help us to do stuff, we welcome you to yeah, come, come in and Yeah, come to Petaluma, us. see the studio. It's open every day. Other question? Right. Well, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask one more question, which is, if you have one more piece, one more piece in your lifetime, if you know you get to build one more piece, what's it going to be? <laughs> it's got to be. <laughs> what do you think? That's a tough one. Because yeah. would it be a permanent piece, or would it be the, <laughs> the next Burning Man piece? The next one we want to build. Well, I just want to build one more piece with you. Well, two more, three more. <laughs> Five more. Yeah. That'd be um, hard to say. Shoot. I think we'd have to do one, one permanent piece, actually. I think so. So that it could be enjoyed over the years and years. I mean, because we That's go to true. so many churches building. I mean, everywhere we go, we're inspired. And so to have something that could exist that someone could walk into. I mean, yes, they do exist in these photographs, but it's not the same as actually being there and walking inside of something. So something permanent, yeah. Permanent, I mean, if it's sure. one more piece, yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's so it would have to be. Yeah, definitely. One more piece. And that Ceramic. would take uh, it would take forty, photophiles. fifty years to make. So <laughs> yeah, we'll just work on one last thing for the rest of our lives. How about that? I like that. I like that. That's how they Great. used to do it. I know. Oh. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, can't wait to see what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you, John.